a enchaîné avec euh, Orla Doyle, qui est professeur à l'Université de Dublin et qui est professeur invité à l'Université de Bordeaux, soutenu par euh, professeur invité de l'IDEX. Et donc, euh, Orla Doyle est la mère scientifique et euh, logistique pragmatique d'un programme qui s'appelle Preparing for Life en Irlande, qui, je vous le dis, vous entendez beaucoup parler du Abecedarian et du Perry, du Perry Preschool qui a été fait dans les années 70. Et bien maintenant, vous allez entendre parler de Preparing for Life. C'est un programme qui a, comme elle va vous montrer, un devis très robuste qui a visé les familles les plus vulnérables, qui montre des effets positifs et pour lequel on a la possibilité de, de, de faire un tel programme ici euh, dans la région, euh, un projet dont j'aimerais vous parler à la fin de euh, cette conférence. Merci, Omar. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to Solana for inviting me to present to you today. So, Today I'm going to talk about an early intervention program which we have been running in uh, Dublin, along with Bashar and Silvana for the last eight years. So this is a pretty uh, long project that we've been working on. Um, and the name of the project and the intervention is called Preparing for Life. It is a home visiting program that starts during pregnancy and continues until the children start school. So it's a very long and intensive intervention, but as you'll see, it, it has had very large effects. And we've been evaluating it in Ireland using a randomized control trial. But first, a little bit of background. So we know that there are large socioeconomic inequalities in children's skills. So children from lower um, SES backgrounds, where there's, say, low parental education, low income, uh, those children typically have poor uh, cognitive skills, poor behavioral or uh, more behavioral problems, and poor socio-emotional skills as well. Um, we know that these early skills are influenced by both innate or genetic factors, or as you have just seen, they can also be influenced by the type of environments that the children are exposed to early in their life. Um, there is evidence, uh, mainly from the US, that targeted early intervention programs can be an effective way of trying to improve the types of environments that disadvantaged children face. Um, and this can be a way, a mechanism of trying to reduce social inequalities in children's skills. And as an, I'm an economist, I call children's skills, cognitive skills, social skills, and human, human capital. Um, and theoretically, these types of programs may be effective from both a biological perspective, but also an economic perspective. So first, from a biological perspective, we know that our brains are much more malleable early in life, particularly between the ages of zero and three. So if we invest during this period, it's more likely to have a bigger impact than if we invest later. Um, these interventions are also effective from an economic perspective because if we invest early and that intervention is effective and it improves children's skills early in life, then we can reap the returns from that investment over a longer period of time. So it's also economically efficient. Now one issue, however, with this literature on early intervention programs is almost all of the evidence that we have on the short and long-term effectiveness of these programs is based on data from the US, on studies that were conducted in the US. We have very little evidence from, from countries in Europe, from Ireland, from Germany, from France, that these types of interventions are going to be effective in countries where arguably we do provide much more generous social welfare policies as standard care compared to the US. So we actually have no evidence, no rigorous evidence using randomized controlled trials that these types of interventions are going to be as effective or as cost effective here. So with this in mind, the aim of this study was to um, use a randomized control trial where we experimentally modified the type of environment that children were exposed to through a home visiting program to investigate whether an early intervention program could be effective in this case in Ireland. Um, the name of the program is Preparing for Life. It is the longest running early childhood intervention program in Ireland, which has been evaluated using a randomized control trial. And as far as I can tell, um, I think it's actually the longest running program um, in, in Europe as well. So, uh, the program was developed because it's based on one very disadvantaged community in Dublin. And within that community, there was evidence that the children who were living there were scoring below the norm in terms of their cognitive skills, their socio-emotional skills, and they also had poor health as well when they were starting school. So the overall aim of this program was to raise the children's school level, school level, school readiness skills by working with the parents from pregnancy until age five. 
So the basic idea was to equip parents with the skills and the knowledge that they needed to sufficiently invest in their children to improve their outcomes. The name of the program, as I said, is Preparing for Life. Starting back in 2008, we recruited 233 pregnant women and we randomly assigned 115 to the treatment group and 118 to the, to the, to the control group. Every family who joined the program received, received some service, some support, which they wouldn't have otherwise received if they were not part of the program. So as you can see, both, fam or both groups received four services or five services in common. They all received 100 euros worth of developmental toys and book packs for every year they were in the program. They also got access to one year free preschool, um, enhanced high quality preschool. They also were encouraged to attend public health workshops on stress control and healthy eating. They both had information or access to an information worker who could help them access other services in their community. And finally, they both were invited to PFL events like sports days, Christmas parties, things like that. But what Preparing for Life is really about are these three additional intensive parenting supports that were only provided to families in what we call the high treatment group. And that included a five-year home visiting program, a triple P group parent training program, and baby massage classes, which I'll talk about just now. So, so preparing for life is a, uh, a home, well, the first treatment that the families receive is a home visiting program. Home visiting programs are programs that provide support and education to parents, and typically starting during pregnancy, sometimes starting at birth and going onwards, age two or age five. Meta-analyses of these programs have shown that they can be effective, um, but often the effect sizes are quite small. Um, in Parent for Life, every family in the high treatment group has a mentor who visits the house once every two weeks, um, starting during pregnancy, continuing to age five. And the role of the mentor is really to support the parents around parenting and child development, using a set of tip sheets, and there's 210 tip sheets in total. As you can see here, the majority of the tip sheets, 60%, are focusing on the children's physical health and well-being. About 12% focus on the children's cognitive development, 14% on language development, 17% on approaches to learning, and 34% on social and emotional well-being. So it is quite a holistic program that's trying to target multiple areas of the child's development. The second main treatment is the Triple P Parenting Program, which is offered to the parents between the ages of two and three years old. This is a uh, program developed it's in operation all around the world, unlike the home visiting program, which is a home-based program, let's call it a, a program developed in the community in Ireland. Triple P is an international program. It aims to promote positive parenting practices. And within Preparing for Life, Group Triple P is what was offered. Okay, so these is, this is where the parents came together in small groups for five weeks and they worked through vignettes. Um, uh, role play, all about how to engage in positive parenting. And the final treatment was baby massage, offered in the first year. And the aim of the baby massage classes were really to encourage greater communication between mothers and their infants, um, and to, for mothers to have the skills to relax and stimulate their infants as well. Um, and they received five baby massage classes. Okay, so who was invited to participate? Um, eligibility criteria was simple. You had to be pregnant, you had to be living in the catchment area. We recruited a sample in the maternity hospitals, and on average, the women were about 20 <coughs> weeks pregnant, so halfway through the pregnancy. This was completely a voluntary program. There was no referrals, okay? So women had to self-select that they were going to join this program, and we found that half of all eligible women, half of all women who were pregnant at that time, decided to join the program. Once women joined the program, they were randomly assigned to the high or low treatment group using an unconditional probability randomization strategy. Um, we then tested for baseline equivalents of the treatment in the control group, and we found that the two groups did not differ on 92% of the 116 baseline measures that we assessed. So we were pretty confident that our randomization worked, that there was no statistical differences between the two groups before we began. They were equivalent. Methodology, we have accessed a lot of data and assessed um, these families in quite a lot of depth. We assessed the parents and the children when the infants were 6, 12, 18, 24, 36, 48 months and at school entry. Um, we examined a whole range of parenting 
measures, the whole environment measures, but the measures of the children which we focused on was their cognitive skills, their social and emotional skills, their behavior, and also their health. We collected data from lots of different sources, including parent reports, direct assessment, teacher report, and medical records. Um, in terms of the statistical methods that we use to estimate treatment effects, we, we use kind of, if you like, non-standard methods. We try to improve the methodology that is used in randomized controlled trials. So we use permutation-based hypothesis testing to deal with the small sample size that we have. We use inverse probability weighting to deal with differential attrition across the treatment and control group, because this is a very long trial, six years, there was dropout at certain points in time. We deal, use a step-down procedure to deal with multiple hypothesis testing, because we are testing so many outcomes at the same time. This increases the probability of making a type 1 error. And finally, in all our analyses, we control for gender, because there's an imbalance. There's more boys in the treatment group than girls, and that happened at random. We didn't cause, obviously, because Okay, so I'm going to go through um, a set of results now. We have hundreds of results. I'm not going to show you them all, just show you some. Um, so the first area that we looked at is the children's cognitive skills. Um, in all of the tables I'm going to show you, they all look like this. We first report the mean and standard deviation of the high treatment group, the mean and standard deviation of the low treatment group, the effect size, which for the continuous outcomes is a standardized measure of effects in terms of standard deviations. <coughs> For cutoffs, for binary outcomes, it's odds ratios. The first set of p-values, IPW p-values, are the p-values that result from an inverse probability weighted permutation test. And then the second column there are the ones adjusted for multiple hypothesis testing. So firstly, we, uh, um, we assess cognitive skills during the program using parent report measures of DP3, that's the developmental profile assessment the ages and stages communication score, and the ages and stages problem solving score. And what we show is that the program ha had a significant impact on the children's um, cognitive skills across most measures. So the, the children in the high treatment group had higher DP3 scores, significantly higher DP3 scores at 24, 36, and 48 months. In terms of the ASP communication scores, they had better scores at 36 months. And in terms of the problem solving scores, they had better problem solving skills at 24 and 36 months as well. And the effect sizes are about between, well, they range between 0 0.2 and 0.4 with standard deviation. So this, these are the measures that we assessed during the program. We also assessed, we also, can, we also assessed uh, the cutoff scores. Um, so this is looking at the clinical significance of the results, if you like. So we find that the children in the treatment group are more likely to score above average in terms of their DP3 scores at each of the three time points. There was no differences in communication skills, or the proportion of children scoring within the, if you like, the clinical range of having communication problems. However, there were effects of ABs on the ages and stages problem solving scores um, at both 24 months and 36 months a significantly lower proportion of the treatment group were likely to score within this clinical range. Next, we assessed the children's cognitive skills at the end wrong way, cognitive skills at the end of the program using direct assessments. So those results I've just showed you before are based on parent report. These are based on the British ability scales, which are direct assessments we conducted where the children were on average 51 months of age and they had just finished the program or were about to finish the program. Um, and we report both the BAS, the British Ability Scales continuous scores, as well as the proportion of children scoring above average and the proportion of children scoring below average in terms of their cognitive skills. And as you can see, we find basically across every measure that we assess that the children in the high treatment group have statistically significantly higher scores than children in the low treatment group. So you can see that the children in the high treatment group have a higher general conceptual ability higher spatial ability, higher pictorial reasoning ability, and higher language ability. And if you look at the size of the effects, we're looking at about a 10 point difference in IQ between the treatment group and the control group, if you just compare the raw differences between them. And we're seeing a standardized effect of 0.77, which is almost two thirds of a standard deviation increase in children's skills. We also find that children in the high treatment group are less likely to score below average across all different types of cognitive abilities, and they're more likely to score above average across all types of abilities apart from spatial ability. 
So this is probably the main set of results that have emerged from the program in terms of statistical significance and also clinical significance. Next, we looked at the impact of the program on children. Okay. Next, we assessed the impact of the program on children's behaviour during the program, and we used the British, uh, we used the CBCL, the Child Behavioural Checklist, at 24, 36, and 48 months. Um, we looked at overall total problems, we looked at externalising problems and internalising problems, and what we find is that the children in the treatment group are less likely to display CBCL total problems at, 20, at 36 months. Um, and this is mainly driven by reductions in their externalizing problems. We don't see any reduction in internalizing problems. So again, going back to the last presentation, it's really those aggressive behaviors that these children are engaging in less. Well, we really see no difference in terms of internalizing behaviors like anxious or fearful behavior. Um, so in terms of externalizing behaviors, we identify treatment effects at 36 and 48 months, um, but not in this case at 24 months. With the CBCL, you can also create cutoff scores that indicate the proportion of children who are at risk of scoring within the borderline or abnormal range. And here we find, again, we find significant treatment effects on almost all of the measures that we assessed. So we find that a significantly lower proportion of the treatment group are likely to score within the clinical range for total problems at 24, 36, and 48 months. And if you look at externalizing problems, again, you can see reductions across each age range. And just an example, I'll just highlight one of them. So for example, at 48 months, none of the children in the high treatment group were scoring in the clinical range for externalizing problems, compared to 16% of children in the high treatment group. And again, if you look at the uh, effects, there is no, that's the problem. Couldn't calculate the odds ratio because there was zero in the, in the treatment group, but it's a very, trust me, it's a very large effect, 16%. Um, we actually here also identify effects in terms of internalizing behaviors, um, in terms of cutoffs. So while the program has no impact, if you like, on the overall level of internalizing problems, it is for those children who, are, who are, have the potential to score within the clinical range, it's raising the amount of, it's raising the probability, it's reducing the probability that they will score within the clinical range in terms of internalizing problems, um, at least at 24 and 48 months. Okay, the next area that we look at is the children's socio-emotional skills, and we assess this during the program using the BITC, which is the Brief Infant Toddler Socio-Emotional Scale, which has two subdomains, competencies and problem behavior, somewhat similar to CBCL, it's a little different, you can use it much earlier in the life cycle. Um, we find no significant treatment effects on the total uh, or on the continuous measures of the competency scores, but we do find that children in the high treatment group are less likely to have problems at 24 months, socio-emotional problems at 24 months. We then at 48 months measured pro-social behavior using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, and we found that children in the high treatment group are more likely to engage in better pro-social behavior than those in the control group, but there was no differences in terms of those experiencing peer problems. So these are the continuous scores. We also looked at the cutoff scores, and we basically see exactly the same picture. So children in the treatment group are less likely to score within the clinical range for the BITC problem score, and they're less likely to score within the clinical range for the SDQ pro-social behavior score as well. So kind of replicating the continuous results. And the final area that we looked at is the children's health. We have many, many hundreds of different measures of health, which we assessed over the course of the trial um, using parent-reported measures so at the end of the trial, we wanted a more objective measure for children's health. So we accessed their medical records from the children's hospital that these children would attend. Um, so these are all based on hospital records, not doctor's records, but actually making it to the hospital. So the first area that we looked at are the children's overall use of hospital services. And this is between birth and when the children were four years old. So the first measure that we looked at is the number of initial visits to the hospital for a new health event. So basically, how many times do children go to hospital um, uh, for a unique health event? And we found that there was no statistically significant differences on this measure. So treatment group went about four times, control group went about five times. That's about a lot of times anyway, going to hospital five times before you're four years old. Um, but no differences there. However, we did find that the treatment group used less follow-up services than the control group. 
which means that the treatment group used less hospital services overall. So on average, we found that the treatment group used six hospital services before they were four years old, compared to the control group who used 10 hospital services. Um, and this is a statistically significant result. This result obviously is important for the children, but from, as an economist, it also has significant health economics or like economic consequences given the costs associated with hospital use. We also looked at the hospital departments they attended. We found no differences in the proportion of children who had ever visited the emergency department. So 97% of children in both groups had visited the emergency department about at least once before the age of four. So they go to the hospital a lot in this community. But we do find that the treatment group go to the emergency department a lot less often than the treatment group. So on average, the um, treatment group went to the emergency department about three and a half times compared to four and a half times in the control group. And again, this difference is statistically significant. We find basically the same result when we look at the emergency department clinic, which is where you go to get, say, your, your stitches changed, new bandages on, things like that. Um, then we looked at the emergency department use in more detail to see why they were going to the emergency department. Um, and we found some effects on in some areas, some no effects in other areas. So we found that the children in the treatment group were less likely to be rated by the triage staff as being an urgent case. Okay, so 39% of the high treatment group had ever been rated by the staff at the hospital as being urgent, compared to 69% of the control group. But we found no differences in the proportion of the groups who had ever, the proportion who had ever gone to the emergency department due to an accident. Okay, so it was 59% in the treatment group, 72% in the control group, so much higher in the, in the control group, but this difference is not statistically significant. And we also found no statistically significant differences in the proportion who had ever gone to the emergency department because of GP referral. And then the final areas that we looked at were, out, well, we have actually more, but the final areas that I'm showing you are outpatient services. Um, so this is where you go if it's not, if you're not going to be inpatient services or you're not going to uh, emergency department. So we found across most of the areas that we looked at, the treatment group used significantly less outpatient services than the control group. So they used less orthopedic services, less physiotherapy services, um, but there was no differences in what's called uh, in, in general pediatrics across the two groups. Um, so that's just, again, I have, we have many, many, many results. This is just a selection in a 20-minute presentation. Can't anything. So um, just to summarize then, um, so what this program shows is that these types of programs can be effective in settings that are outside of North America. Um, we have found that the program has improved children's cognitive skills, their socio-emotional skills, and their health of a targeted disadvantaged sample. And the size of the effects are also really important here because the size of the effects that we found in this trial are actually larger than the effects that are typically found in US studies of similar programs. And this is somewhat of a surprise to us because we would have expected smaller effects within the European study than in the US study because we already provide an awful lot of support to disadvantaged families in Ireland. Um, again, I, I didn't go into this in a lot of detail in this presentation, but we show that the results are robust to small sample size, differential attrition, multiple hypothesis testing, differential misreporting, and contamination, spillover effects, performance bias. You, you mentioned I need to do an RCT, we probably tested for it in, in this trial. Some potential mechanisms that may underlie these treatment effects. So at every single time point, we've also collected measures of the home environment, measures of parenting, measures of social support, childcare use. We have about 200 different outcome, outcome measures at every time point. And some of the significant treatment effects that we found was that children in the treatment group um, are being exposed to higher quality home environments. Their environments are safer. They're being fed better food. Their parents engage in less permissive parenting styles and so on. They watch less TV, for example. Um, the good news with this program is that it is now being rolled out in Ireland in, in one other or in two other sites, but on a pretty still small scale. We have plans to try to replicate this program in a number of different European countries, hopefully France as well. Um, although all this is obviously funded, funding and dependent. And um, if anyone would like more information on the trial, I am presenting the plug. I'm presenting uh, here in board it, in the university next Friday um, for a full hour, I think. So if anyone wants to learn more about the trial, please come to my presentation on Friday week. I don't know what room it's in, but I'll find out. So is it here? 
in, in this room, Friday week, 30th of, sorry, 24th of March. I'll go into all, oh, here I have to be pretty sure, but I'll go into everything in a lot more detail then. Oh, 45 minutes, oh, now I've got it. I can still do that. Okay, um, thank you very much.